Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have John Roseman and he's talking about his book, Teen Proofing, Fostering Responsible Decision Making in Your Teenager. So we're going to be doing some scenario planning and and uh, get a sense of how you may work with your teen um, during what are some oftentimes challenging years. So welcome, John. Hi, CJ. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, so I it's... Uh, these are challenging years, the teenage years, and um, you do a beautiful job explaining why. One of the things I've, a story I've retold is how you describe all the different stages that a child goes through, and you know, in the terrible twos, uh, our child actually moves from a place of where we actually become the authority, and and uh, they have a tantrum as a result of it. And then, as they become adolescent, when they become teenagers, we have a tantrum because they actually get control <laughs> over the situation. And that that alone was completely worth just reading the entire book. <laughs> just that thought alone was. Oh, well, I'm glad. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and I think that that's one of the hardest things to do is as parents nowadays, we tend to micromanage and there's so many different parenting techniques out there that they tend to be confusing. What have you found when you've talked to parents out there? Well, I find that parents are very, very confused and the confusion began, CJ, when American parents started listening to people like me tell us how to raise kids. <laughs> uh, prior to the 1960s, during which, uh, in addition to a, a lot of other sociological things that were happening, um, we began uh, listening to professionals tell us how to raise kids. I call it the psychological parenting revolution of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And um, the watershed year was 1965 when a book by a Manhattan psychologist named Chaim Gannat. The book title was Between Parent and Child was published. And this became a huge bestseller, and publishers began, as a consequence of that, beating the bushes looking for other people in the mental health professions primarily who could write books that would capitalize on the success of Gannat. And... Uh, Today, on Amazon.com, over 100,000 parenting books are listed. I, and I'm oh fairly God. certain, by the way, that that is the largest nonfiction category, is parenting. Wow. And uh, there's no way that this um, can be anything but completely confusing to parents. <laughs> well, prior, prior to the 1960s, you know, if you had a problem with it, and, and I am a psychologist. I mean, I'm licensed by the North Carolina Psychology Board. Um, we can talk about that if you want to. Uh, my, my, the fact that I don't believe in psychology. Yeah, that's uh, what I, I didn't want to talk. I, that was my next question. Yeah, well, question. we can do that. Yeah, we well, can because do that because, you know, I, I'll be as radical as possible and you share it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, prior to the 1960s, you had a problem with a child. You, you didn't go to some expert. Well, you did, but the expert in question didn't have capital letters after her name. <laughs> I call her grandma. You went, you went to your mother. You went to your grandmother. <laughs> and you sat funny. down at her kitchen table, and she didn't charge you anything. She wasn't watching the <laughs> clock. It was a wonderful situation. Yeah, the, and sadly, the whole family unit has eroded. So even those conversations with grandma don't happen anymore, right? I mean, their grandma's in a house; it's hard to get to. Um, but I want to go. Yeah, back. well, how many grandmas are there? You know, there's know. step grandma, and then there's step step grandma. So yeah. Yeah. All right. So I have a question. I'm one of those confused parents, and I like reading books because often they help just help me come up with tools and ways of thinking about problems and. You know, I think that there's a role for psychology and counselors in some instances when they probably help and some ways in which they hurt. So I wanted to start off on the positive note. In what instances do you think they actually help? And when, when do you enroll a psychologist or a, a counselor? And when do they actually help? What situations? Okay, well, l let me make a distinction between counseling, which does not necessarily have to be based on psychological paradigms and 
psychotherapy or psychological counseling, which is based on psychological paradigms. Mm -hmm. um, the listener can take my word for it that no form of psychological therapy has ever demonstrated reliable efficacy. In other words, uh, and, and more specifically, the research uh, shows over and over and over again that people who go to see a licensed therapist, one-third of them get better, one-third get worse, and one-third stay about the same, which means, on average, uh, there is no positive result. Hmm. And that is because the psychological counseling in question is is built on theoretical paradigms that have never been proven. The American public doesn't know this. I mean, for example, take self-esteem, CJ. Mm -hmm. The American public thinks, well, you know, psychologists talk about self-esteem. It must be a valid concept. But in fact, all of the research, and I mean all of it, that's been done in the last 20 years or so, um, has demonstrated that self-esteem is highly associated with antisocial, sociopathic characteristics. In addition to that, people with <laughs> high self-esteem are highly prone to become depressed. Um, if they're not nice people, they're really, uh, they're, they're sad people. And, you know, I tell, uh, the, the research also says, this is a woman-to-woman -woman show, I... I uh, want to point out to our audience, uh, largely female, I'm assuming, that women, the research indicates, are in danger if they are in relationship with males who have high self-esteem. Hmm. Because these individuals believe what they want, they deserve to have. Uh, you know, high self-esteem is an entitlement attitude. Hmm. Hmm. See, I always thought of self-esteem when I, when I read all the various... Um, parenting books. It's about having a child that has confidence and um, a sense of tenacity and ability to thrive, um, which is different than, I think, a narcissistic kid who's trying to be arrogant, conceited, and control the situation. So I guess it's maybe a... a or, or are you thinking of self-esteem in the same way? The... Um, the the term refers, we, we ought to use the term accurately, CJ, self-esteem, esteem for one's own self. Mm -hmm. um, and that is different than, uh, you know, having tenacity and the belief that you are capable of handling life's problems adequately, which, by the way, is different than believing that you are capable of solving every problem thrown your way. Mm. There is a... And the studies indicate this, too, that there is a false confidence that often comes with high self-esteem in that people with high self-esteem do believe, tend to believe, that they are capable of solving any and all problems that are thrown at them, <laughs> which, right. of course, is never true in a life, you know? Yeah. It's just, uh, and, and it, but if you believe that, then uh, you, your coping skills when you are confronted with the reality that you aren't capable of solving all of life's problems, um, you're capable of dealing with them adequately, but not maybe solving them, um, your, uh, your coping skills collapse. Mm. And this is why it has been found that people with high self-esteem are highly prone to fairly serious uh, and frequent episodes of depression. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I want to go in a different yeah. path because you started saying, but you know, here's the net of it. Psychotherapy from your research is a third stay the same, a third change, and a third get worse. And you made a distinction between psychotherapy and, and counseling. I wanted to go back and, why, and understand why you made that distinction between it, or in your mind, are they different? And is one, are they both equally problematic? No, no, people who, you know, I, I believe counseling uh, is a very valid process and can be a very helpful process. Um, here's what I believe, CJ. Good counseling comes from the heart. It does not mm -hmm. come from the head. Mm -hmm. Graduate school trains the head. It doesn't train the heart. Uh, interestingly enough, research 
researchers have also discovered that if people don't know the educational level of the person they're talking to, they rate people uh, in terms of counseling effectiveness. They rate people who only have high school educations as highly as they rate PhDs. Mm. And so what that means what that means is that you're as likely to get good advice from your barber, your hairdresser, as you are Dr. So and so and you're and you're paying him a hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> I get it. So counseling is, I get it. So one is kind of, you know, when you're talking to your barber or counselor, they don't, they come at it from like, here's my life experience. Here's what I think. I love you and I'm trying to really help you out. Um, And that's why they can be equally as good as someone who has a PhD because it's coming from the heart, like you said, versus the head. I get it. And And I get the, and the whole grandma thing totally cements the whole idea versus a theoretical process where you're trying to jam someone into a category they actually according to the american psychiatric have adhd or you know like all those kind of things when then you start trying to fit someone into a paradigm and try to solve the problem versus really understanding the kid i is that what you mean right so for example when i uh when i see people the first thing i do is tell them uh i don't do diagnosis um, I, I don't recommend medication. Mm. I don't do testing uh, because I fail to see through the research that any of those um, really advance a person's likelihood of resolving whatever problem they're bringing to me and getting better. Mm. Mm. So we just talk. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to go to a story that I found a fact in your book that I found fascinating. All right, you talk to, uh, in the book, you talk about J, initial J, who was a straight-A student and who by 18 had been in jail on two occasions, one for stealing a road sign, the second for creating a public affray. Um, This person, J, smoked marijuana on a regular basis and possibly fell down drunk. And at the end of the junior year, Jay, who previously was at a junior year in college, Jay, who was previously an A student, almost flunked out of school. Um, so, please reveal who Jay is. <laughs> well, that would be me, John. <laughs> I was shocked. You, you sort of suspected that, didn't you, CJ? No, I didn't. I was like, and I had to reread it. I'm like, what? I literally read back and said, wait, did he say it was him? Who did all these things? Okay, I was kind of shocked. I was. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I went to college. I joined a rock and roll band. The band I joined, uh, we used to open for Aria Speedwagon. Wow. Uh, The 1960s, if you were in rock and roll, that was a very dangerous time to be playing rock and roll music, (laughs) I will tell you. And, uh, you know, I just got uh, completely and totally caught up in that lifestyle. Mm. Um, I, don't, I don't have any great regrets, uh, but, what, you know, I told the story because, uh, you know, I wanted to illustrate the fact that kids, uh, and I was, you know, I just fell flat on my face from the time I was 18 uh, until I met and married my wife two and a half years later. Mm. And... Um, You know, so for two and a half years, I was just, you know, flat on my face, you know, playing rock and roll, doing all kinds of bad things. And, uh, I mean, uh, you know, nothing that would hurt other people, but just very self-destructive, irresponsible stuff. The reason I told the story is, you know, to say, look, you know, a kid can go through a phase like this and still turn out okay. These things should be alarming, and certainly should not be ignored, but they are not necessarily apocalyptic. Mm. And that's a huge thing to remember. I, okay, so now I want one of the things I love, love, love about your book, Teen Proofing, is you give lots of lots of sample dialogue on, and I think as parents, sometimes you just need to hear what another parent is saying and, you know, and modify from there. So I actually have a a modern-day version of you. Not exactly, but I'll tell you the story 
and I was hoping that you could um, give some insight on, you know, how you approach how to make someone a responsible decision maker when they're teens. So I have a friend who uh, is a single mom, and she divorced her husband because he was an alcoholic, and um, ha- an alcoholic who has not since been able to get his act together and find a job. Okay, so no surprise, her son got involved with alcohol and pot, and was getting stoned all the time in high school. Um, barely, barely graduated from the uh, a very nice private uh, uh, private school that they went to. Is now enrolled in college, and the and has made a series of bad decisions. Recently, this child um, was given a stash of money for graduation, which was intended to spend on book supplies, PCs, etc. And instead, this child spent all the money on pot and partying all summer long. And this child is planning on living at home. So it's got like the trilogy of like, you know, it's got, (laughs) you know, allowances. It's someone who's smoking pot. This child is now living at home, which we're now finding as a very common occurrence. And so I know that this is a very uh, complex problem, but these are the problems that a lot of parents or some parents are facing. So if you were talking to this single mom, what what would what advice? And of, of course, the mom is just despondent. And this is someone who's an enrolled, you know, involved parent, cares very deeply, loves her child, but you know has a hard time because you know this the son points to the dad and says, "So what? Dad's doing this? Why do you, I have to find a job and get my act together? My dad's not doing it." And the dad's completely not involved. So that's kind of the whole picture. So yeah. Well, the mom. Uh, th- this is a very typical sort of scenario. I mean, the the the, uh, the specifics may change from situation to situation, CJ, but I'm very, very familiar with this type of scenario with this age kid. And um, what I would speculate, uh, based on a lot of experience, is, um, is that this mother is very conflicted concerning how to deal with this mm-hmm. young person, her mm-hmm. son. And the reason I suspect that she's conflicted is that, let's face it, she should have known better than to give a kid who has a history of drug use, alcohol use, and abuse in both cases, and uh, irresponsible partying, uh, a large stash of money. Mm -hmm. She should have supervised that money. She should have kept it. She should have made sure that it was spent on what it was intended to be spent on. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she didn't use good common sense, and if if someone said this to her, you know, what were you thinking? (laughs) Giving your son, who's got this history, this amount of money, what were you thinking? She would probably immediately realize how um, that this was a very bad decision on her part, but it indicates the degree of conflict that she herself is going through. Mm-hmm. She, uh, you know, she enables him at times, and then she wonders why he persists in doing what he's doing. And as long as she is conflicted, he has no reason to change his behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is a kid who needs to be completely cut off. And I'm not saying kicked out of the house necessarily, although that would certainly be an option. But uh, cut off from uh, any and all source of, of money uh, from this mother until he straightens out his act. Yeah, so I can see how the mom would be conflicted. I don't know the exact ins and outs because it's not a very close, it's a, you know, a friend of a friend. But in this particular case, like the mom, I assume, is like, you know, she doesn't want to put her kid out on the street. That's a conflict, right? You see your kid, they're suffering. You don't want to put them out on the street. But how would you break down the problem? So first there's the drug use, like drug use and not barely being able to get together, getting your school together, and then you're sending this kid off to college. And one of the things that I really liked about your book, Team Proofing, is that you set out 
a game plan that says here's the, here are the things that we respect we expect and here are the things that we want you to be responsible for and here are the consequences if you don't um what would you say for you know this ch child who is smoking pot um and not pulling grades what what are some ways that this mom once she gets unconflicted could do well i mean i'm not absolutely certain as to what i would do based on uh that amount of information, but I do know, A, that this mother is very conflicted and that her um, her conflicts over this lead her to, uh, to engage in a lot of enabling with this young man. She enables, he takes advantage of her enabling, and then uh, she turns around and complains about his behavior. Uh, what she and this boy are caught in is a very, very vicious cycle. I would try and persuade her to cut him off of any funding whatsoever, number one. Number two, it's obvious that college is a waste of time and, and money at this point in time. So the second thing that I would do is stop paying for college. If he has a car, I would... Uh, I, I would manage that such, assuming that it's in her name, I would manage that such that he could only use it if he had a job. Mm. And, um, uh, but beyond that, I mean, without knowing a lot more specifics, I, I'd be uh, hard pressed to say what I'd do beyond that point or recommend beyond that point. Yeah, and I think that... It's, it's a hard situation, and let's actually take something that's very concrete and that you actually do talk about some examples. Maybe you can talk about the examples in your book, but you talk about examples that are very common nowadays where you actually have a kid living at home because you don't want to be homeless. I mean, regardless of, of you know, the situation, the kid smoking pot, um, you know, and it's, it's not, I just talked to another, I was talking to my yoga teacher, and she said, yeah, well, my, um, my my new husband has two kids that are 21 and 23. They're potheads. They're staying in our house. Uh, they don't bother us very much, but they don't get work either, and they're living in the house. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And I said, are they planning on getting jobs? And she's like, well, I don't see them making any motions to. And so... <laughs> I thought, oh my God, please, I hope this doesn't happen to me. Um, but how, how, how would you, you know, th and this is very common, like, that's an extreme example, but how do you deal with situations nowadays where kids are coming oh, home? Well, you know, I mean, here, here's the thing, CJ, you, you, uh, you know, this is what happens to me. People come to me and they describe these situations that have ensued as a consequence of making very bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And then they think that there is some, uh, th that psychologists or counselors are endowed with some magical ability to straighten all this out, to figure out how to straighten it out. You know, why in the world did this woman marry a guy who had children who were potheads and living at home? That's the first question I would ask. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Yeah. You know, and the second thing I would, you know, it's, it's this, this um, fundamental lack of common sense on the part of people that, that is, the, is the cause of most of the problems that people bring to me or to any other psychologist <laughs> or counselor, I dare say. Okay. And it's just, you know, it's common sense. It's, you, you hear these stories and, and, and you just want to go, what were you thinking? What were you thinking marrying a guy who had two young adult children who are bums, smoke pot all day long, don't have jobs, and are living at home? Why would you want to go live in that situation and then turn around and start complaining about it? Yeah. <laughs> you should have, you know, what, yeah. you like soap opera in your life? <laughs> 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 Well, I think actually, okay, so here's a thing that you offered in your book, which I think is fantastic, which you said, parent and children, here's what I'm going to read a passage, parent and child should set sure. goals along with a specific plan of action and time frame for reaching those goals. So, for example, the agreement might stipulate that the young person will be out of the house in six months, 
The first month will be spending finding the job, the second and third paying off debts, and the fourth and fifth building a financial cushion, and the sixth finding an affordable place to live. Like that's a game plan, right? Where uh, I, I just don't understand why you wouldn't do that. I mean, <laughs> well, it's a no, it's a brilliant game plan, CJ. I came up with it. Yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> but here, here's the problem. The problem is getting people to do it. You know, you could describe something like this. You could say, all right. Put them on a six-month program. At the end of six months, they're out of the house. Right. But it begs the question, what if at the end of six months, they are still smoking pot, they don't have jobs, they're still bums, what do you do then? You well, kick them out of the house. I say you kick them out of the house. But, <laughs> but uh, there is no doubt about it. The reason that after six months, they are still smoking pot and don't have jobs is because these parents are enablers. And so when, it, when push comes to shove, uh, when the tire is ready to hit the road, these parents are not going to kick these kids out of the house. Mm -hmm. They will simply complain. And if somebody says to them, well, kick the kids out, then they'll go, well, oh, but I don't want them living under a bridge. So you'd rather have them living with you and make your life miserable. You know, with what we've got here is the people who are miserable are not the people with the problem. How about this? The people who are miserable are the pe people who have the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Because how are you, again, yeah. fostering respons responsible decision-making? So it seems like... <laughs> I, and I know that's hard. So, like, maybe an interim would be like, okay, it looks like we, you know, during, you know, month two or three, when it looks like the kid is still smoking pot, say, well, I think it's clear to me that I'm looking at what's happening. And at, by month six, I have some serious doubts that you're even going to be out of here. So, I mean, it, it seems like you could be checking, you know, month one, they don't or aren't spending time finding a job saying, okay, if you're not going to find a job, then the alternative is for you to start uh, looking for another place. We start looking at friends. I mean, give, you know, you may need my help in finding out ideas, but it looks like you're going to be out of the house in six months. Start looking, right? I mean, wouldn't, is that what you would do if your kid was still smoking pot? Oh, yeah, that's what I would do. But see, I, I don't have any problem, and my wife does not have any problem following through with that, pulling the trigger on that at the end of six months. But a lot of people, I would say the overwhelming majority of parents who have kids who fit this description have kids who fit this description in large part because these parents are enablers. And when it comes time to pull the trigger on the six month agreement, the, the likelihood that these parents are going to pull that trigger is slim to none. I've run into this over and over and over again. So, CJ, it, you know, these plans, they sound wonderful, and you put these plans in a book, and people say, well, th this is a wonderful plan, of course, let's do this. Fine. And, and, and I, there are people out there who will do it and who are willing to pull the trigger at the end of six months. But what I'm saying to you is the overwhelming majority of people are not willing to do it. What's an enabler, just to make sure that people understand that vocabulary? Because I'm not sure if everyone understands what that means. A, a person who facilitates another person's irresponsibility. Ah, okay, got it. Okay. By continually rescuing in one way, shape, or form, paying the person's bills, uh, bailing the person out of jail, uh, finding the person attorneys, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, got it. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm that mom. I'm going to pretend that I'm that mom. I can't do it because I just will feel so bad. I mean, I will be a bad parent if I throw him out of the house. What will my friends say? I just couldn't. Like, what happens if he slides down and gets even worse? You know, maybe he moves from marijuana to something else. He may actually be falling in a deep, dark hole. So, what would you say to me if you're counseling me? Uh, I would say to you, you know what? I'm very expensive. And, and if you're not going to follow my advice, then there's no point in you spending any more money with me. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. 
I would say this is not a psychological issue. This is a very practical issue. There's no emotional boundary between you and this child. Mm -hmm. This child feels pain. You feel pain. And this is not going to be resolved until you're willing to allow this child to feel pain and uh, not, not share in that pain yourself. Because the minute you start sharing in it, you try and solve it. Mm, uh, and the only person uh, the only person who can solve this child's problems are this child. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. You know, CJ, most most relationship problems involve one simple word boundaries. Mm. People aren't describing boundaries. People have never affected boundaries. And boundaries are not just physical, they're emotional. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and a parent establishes an emotional boundary between herself and a child. And the child. Uh, this is when it needs to be done. It needs to be done when the child is between his second and third birthday. That is the time for establishing an emotional boundary between parent and child. You can't have an emotional boundary prior to age two. You've got to have an emotional boundary from age three on. Mm. And this is part, you know, this is part Mm. of the terrible twos. Yeah. Part of the terrible twos is the parent learning how to allow the child to experience pain as a consequence of not getting what he wants. And just for the parent to stand there and go, you know, my my heart bleeds for you, kid, but I'm not going to do what you want me to do. There's just no way. Mm -hmm. And CJ, this is when most parenting problems begin. They begin between the second and third birthdays, and they begin because the parent... uh, doesn't and is unwilling to establish that emotional boundary between herself Mm -hmm. and her child. And so 20 years later, you've got a 22-year-old kid living at home smoking pot without a job. Okay, that's my worst nightmare. (laughs) Uh, Luckily, I'm not that. and, and, (laughs) and, and, And people come in and they go, help me solve this. And, and I try to get people to understand, well, you know, okay, <laughs> we, 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 can, we can do something to begin disrupting the pattern that began 20 years ago in your relationship with your child. But if you're looking for some sort of instant cure where your child is going to wake up three mornings from now going, Mom, I've got it. I'm going out today and get a job. I'm going to stop smoking pot, and those people I've been hanging around with, I am not going to hang around with them anymore. If you're thinking that's going to happen as a consequence of coming in to see me and talk to me, no, 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 it's not going to happen. And you're going to end up being very, very disappointed in me and even angry because you've got unrealistic expectations of what I can do now that this has been unfolding for 20 years. And this helps answer a question because I... You know, I, I was reading this book thinking, our kids don't do this. I've, I can't even imagine them doing these things. I'd be horrified if they did any of these things. And so what I'm hearing is, yeah, it, I mean, we've been, we are, I think both my husband and I, are, family is our highest priority. We spend a lot of time with our kids, a lot of quality time with our kids. I just can't imagine any of these things ever happening. I mean, so, so... These are situations in which, you know, it's, it began early and it just continues where the, the parent doesn't put any boundary. So, and we, we're, we are very boundary to their children. So of course, we don't want them to feel pain, but we have boundaries. So, because I, 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 I was looking at this saying, am, am I missing something? Am I going to experience these things at, at some point? Because I haven't yet, and my kids are 14 and 16. Well, if uh, if your kids are fourteen and sixteen, and and there's no, um, there's been no, uh, uh, you know, indication to this point of uh, potential waywardness, I'll I'll phrase it that way. I mean, you're probably out of the woods. Um, 
CJ, but you know, there are no guarantees. Here, yeah. Here's the thing. Psychology is uh, a deterministic philosophy, which is why psychologists begin asking people questions about their childhood during the first session. And the fact of the matter is that a human life is not determined by how that human was parented. Mm. And we all know this. We, yeah. we know people who have been parented extremely well by moral, upright, responsible, ethical people. And these kids uh, in question took sharp left turns when they were in their late teens or early 20s, went off cliffs and never come back. Mm -hmm. The way that those people were raised does not explain the decisions they made in late adolescence mm -hmm. and early adulthood. Mm -hmm. There's no connection. Yeah. And we also know of stories of people, true stories of people, who were raised by horrible people, abusive people, alcoholic people. Um, you know, mothers who, who uh, brought a, a series of men into the house, that kind of thing. And these people turn out okay and are today in Kenya uh, as missionaries. Mm. And their, the, the, their life as adults can't be explained by how they were raised either. Mm. So this is part of the falsehood of psychology. Psychology thinks everything is deterministic. Mm. And it's not. The most powerful force in a person's life is the person's own free will. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you're out of the woods, CJ. There's, you know, you know, when you're talking possibilities, probabilities, anything is possible. But the probability that your kids, 14 and 16, who've been uh, walking the straight and narrow, more or less, for 14 and 16 years are suddenly going to go nuts um, is is uh, fairly slim. Yeah, you know, I think, when, and, and you mentioned this in the book, the first part of your book emphasis, emphasizes this, because I think as parents we guilt trip ourselves, like, what did I do wrong? What should I do differently? I mean, there's some cases like the situation where the person is conflicted, that may be something you can do differently. But even in that case, the person was conflicted. You know, they did something wrong, they can, they can fix it. But... I think one of the things that I'm hearing you say is, you know, a child comes hard coded with a temperament and that you can't really control. There's some kids that are going to be more risk oriented. Who knows what, what happened in the genetic, gen who knows that kid's just going to be more risk oriented. And th sometimes if you go in a, on the spiritual path, you could just say, you know, if I go into my spiritual path, I could say, well, you know, a person, each person has their own destiny you call it, um, you know, I can't remember, well, you call it something else, but each person can manifest what they're, you know, they are at choice and at free will to manifest what they want, and it's their destiny, not yours. <laughs> so they're going to do whatever right, they, I have, they came down earth to do. You know, my wife and I, we, uh, we had two children, boy and a girl. My wife and I have been married 47 years. Our kids are in their 40s. Our son was a high risk taker, uh, very impulsive. Um, praise God. He decided at the age of 16 he wanted to be a pilot. And so <laughs> he channeled all of his risk taking into flying these machines through the air. Mm. And uh, today he is an international corporate pilot. You know, <laughs> and. and, and yeah, it, but it, you you could have taken that same scenario, this high risk, impulsive, headstrong kid, and um, if his uncle, who was a pilot, hadn't taken him flying when he was sixteen years old, uh, and this kid had an epiphany during that uh, first flight in the cockpit with his uncle, um, who knows what would have happened? Yeah, Ugh, I just think it's fascinating. Right, I mean, and I, but but here's yeah, the thing: you did, the, the kid had their own path, temperament path, and but the thing that you did is you channeled it into a productive. Like, I get it. I accept you. I love you. This is who you are, and let's take that and go to a productive path. 
right? I mean, went to his pilot. Yeah, I don't know. I think well, that's what I mean. Well, more hearing. or less, but I, you know, then the other part of that is I wanted, my wife and I wanted our son to um, take a lot of responsibility for his own flight training. So we told him, we'll either pay for your flight training or we'll pay for college. What's it going to be? Because flight training is, you know, to get to the point where you are multi-instrument rated, uh, multi-engine rated, instrument rated, jet rated, et cetera, et cetera, it is expensive. It is a college education. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll pay for your flight training. I'll pay for college. What's it going to be? He had me pay for college, and he paid for his own flight training by, um, by instructing uh, flying jumpers, um, mm. flying law enforcement, uh, looking for marijuana plants, uh, you know, all, <laughs> all kinds of... He, just, well, he was he resourceful. Took any, yes. Yeah, he was. You know, at the age of 20, he's flying the sheriff around the county looking for pot <laughs> plants from the air. And <laughs> not a chip off the old block, okay? And... Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, Oh, I you know, love that story. You know, and a lot of this, I think, is just you know, I'm a very, I'm a very, uh, uh, not religious, but I'm a very spiritual guy, and I just feel like God's hand was in this to some degree. <laughs> well, He certainly helped you write your books, right? I mean, I look at your your he did. The, the narrative that you have in the book about the conversations you have with your son, Eric, and, and I think your daughter, Wendy, and and it's if they weren't that way, and especially Eric, because it sounds like he's the one that was more challenging, you wouldn't have had the, the good fodder to write the book, right? <laughs> he, uh, there was a, a reporter from the New York Times, uh, CJ, who came to our house in North Carolina. Oh, this was about uh, 20, 20 years ago. And the reporter is sitting on the back porch, and at that time, our son and daughter-in-law were living down the street from us. And the reporter said uh, that she would like to talk to Eric. So I called Eric up, and he comes over, and he walks onto the back porch, and he walks up to the reporter, extends his hand, and says, Hi, I'm Eric, my father's career. Oh, I love it. Okay, on that note, yeah. we've, we've been talking to John Roseman, talking about his book, Teen Proofing, Fostering Responsible Decision Making in Your Teenager. Thank you so much for being here. What a fabulous book. Highly recommend it. Lots and lots of good examples in here. Thank you so much for listening, audience. Thank you, Rebel. Have a great weekend, everyone. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support, love, and blessings.